So, at first, I'd like to say thank you to the organizers for giving to me the opportunity to discuss <laughs> without you about the Lombards, so that is one of the migrant population present in Europe at the beginning of the Middle Ages. As you know, the approaching to the study of ancient population is never simple, and as we are so far, this challenge can be fought using the interdisciplinarity. So I'm here to present how to present you how the population on the move arrived in Italy and changed the Roman political structure. Especially, I'll introduce you two settlements, maybe the less known, from the north of Italy, Povegliano Veronese, and from the central Italy, La Selvicciola. The bioarchaeological investigation that we are running out in Sapienza University of Rome with the University of Catolica in Milan has the aim to explore the lifestyle of these two Lombard communities as their arrival in Italy and to compare eventual biological changes in the passage from a migrant to a stationary population. Changes that are clearly shown from the material culture. So, from their mythic origins in south of Scandinavia at the beginning of the first century BC, the Lombards left their land and started a very long migration through the north of Europe, along the Danube, the Hungary, or the so-called Pannonia, the Roman region, where they have been spent 42 years before to move to Italy. When Lombards finally arrived in Italy, their Germanic traditions were very strong, as we can see in the dead grave goods. From these moments in Italy, the use of burying the dressed dead starts, and especially a lot of weapons start to be present in warriors' graves. At the end of the 6th century, who has taken part of the battles to conquest the peninsula was buried with typical Germanic weapons and a wooden structure called Trottenbrett, or a Houses of the Dead, where we can see four holes where the pails were located to support the roof. Anyway, during the next generation, <coughs> the generations, this habit changed, underlying a preference for the Byzantine or Roman style, as it is shown in the picture here, where the belt is composed of more pieces, a new weapon is introduced, the scramasax, a single cut knife. The crucial point that starts during the second generation of Lombards in Italy and that, because, and that becomes more evident in the next generation is the representation of the power. It is necessary to specify that with the Lombard invasion, the central control guaranteed by the empire, the Roman Empire, ended. So then, with the third generation, the act of burying the dead is the key moment where all the communities present and the transmission of the <coughs> inheritance status to the dead group is clearly seen and approved. The ritual of the funeral is administrated by the parental group without external forms lasting in time. The variable appeal to sometimes objects in the Germanic or Byzantine style shows that the elements of the funeral items were not chosen to underline the ethnic belongings, but to show off the social prestige achieved. So the grape goods started to be even more rich, up to contain golden stuff for the horse riding, clearly not used, but only given to the dead. On the other hand, the female grape goods uh, had to reflect the man's high status. So if during the first phase, the fibula recall immediately to the Germanic stay, style made in precious materials, during the following generations, the Byzantine influences were even more present. So that is the first, from the first generation and then the next one. Especially the realization of the brooches, as we can see here, where the shape is completely modified. Moreover, a new object become even more common, the wearing words, even if there are some academics that interpret these words not as a tool, but as a kind of a hoarding the metal. So now the message is clear, the power or the high status is shared among a restricted number of people. But how can we understand if in this period of, transi of transition of people and traditions the man was really a horse rider, as suggested by the presence of the staff. So with the aim to answer to this question, two skeletal collections from necropolis is in object <coughs> are here presented from the countryside. So let's start with Povegliano Veronese. This necropolis was discovered in 1985, 15 kilometers of death of the city from, uh, of Verona. 
During the Roman and post-classical periods, the site was along Via Postumia, one of the main ancient Roman roads of northern Italy, that is here in red on the map, used by Germanic population to get into the peninsula. The tombs appear to be organized in large nuclei, and within these are aligned on straight lines, even if often on short segments. Seeing the distribution of sex and age, it seems very likely that each group may represent an extended family group. Even if in other Italian necropolises the organization of the space seems clear because each space and generation occupies a confined zone, on the contrary, at Povegliano Veronese, all sectors of the large necropolis are used for the whole duration with progressive development without changing the area of immigration, that is the factor shown here in C. So, from the analysis of strontium, 26% of the sample population belongs to the group of non-locals, probably migrated <coughs> there during their lifetime. All these individuals show an ancient grave group dating back to the first phase, phase of Lombards in Italy, so around 568. It is interesting to note that these values are compatible with those of the Lombards buried in a Hungarian necropolis of Zola, even if these kinds of data has to be very, very controlled. Finally, a low range of isotopic values of the group of Allochtones does not show correspondences with the other groups. Likely, they were individuals integrated to the Lombards. Sorry to the lovers on their way to Italy to become warriors or to join marriage or because they are prisoners of war. <coughs> Moreover, further analysis on carbon and nitrogen will help us to clarify the diet. It seems clear that the oral hygiene was not so common among the Lombards in Povegliano Veronese. Especially older people show higher percentage of caries, especially from the first generation. This can be, this can maybe uh, explain, be explained because of a carbohydrate-based diet not followed by the Lombards before their arrival in Italy. Indeed, the percentage of caries in the two following generations matches very well with the new diet. This change of life can be seen also in the musculoskeletal stress markers and pathologies. <coughs> 24% of the adults shows clear signs of the osteoarthritis on the back. High rate of degenerative joint disease in the hips and tarsals and metatarsals reveal a heavy stress of the lower skeleton. Moreover, it is, in one case, it's clear the so-called night syndrome. And moreover, a man exhibits several skeletal defects that can reflect changes to, the amputated for, to an amputated forearm. So over the surp surprisingly finds, findings, his survival shows a very deep knowledge of medicine in a, pre in a pre antibiotic area. Finally, from the analysis of the epigenetic traits, two groups of individuals pop up from the east of the necropolis. In the first group of three burials, two of them are, have an equal set of epigenetic traits. The second one, composed by four individuals, shows two individuals with a type of burial, that is called the Tontenbrett, and epigenetics in common. So now let's <coughs> go to the site of La Selvicciola in central Italy. The excavation, still ongoing, revealed the existence of a vast rural villa complex with a well-defined funerary area. Associated with the necropolis was found a Christian church with a single hazel. The rural villa around the 5th century was abandoned and that testified by collapse and black soils into the walls of the buildings and so indicating the use of the inner part of the villa for farm purposes. Moreover, the po population that remained there after the villa abandonment started the funerary area. When the Longobard group arrived on the ruins of the villa, there is a modest living presence witnessed by post holes in the cocciopesto floors of the villa. So the Lombards start living there in wooden huts and burying their dead in the same funerary area. Here, the smallest rectangle that we can see here, <coughs> we can see Longobard groups formed by all armed men with the richest grave goods are shown in, a green, shown in a green circles. It is interesting how parts of them was buried in the church as to imitate the burials as Santa near the holy part of the church. 
and another part remained very well separated in another area of the necropolis. So the paleopathological analysis has underlined the high presence of Cribra orbitalia and hyperostosis in children and adults. A survey based on the consumption of plants and meat showed a low isotopic variability of animal proteins, indicating a good supply of meat, milk, and products derived from these. However, a study conducted on the health <coughs> of the oral cavity showed a high percentage of caries, suggesting an important cereal consumption confirmed by the hyperostosis. Specifically, this pathology seems to be related to the high consumption of cereals. And moreover, a certain difference in diet, specifically about the consumption of, of fish and C14 plants, was in favor of older individuals over the age of 50. And this is also evident in the difference between men and women. So, guided by the archaeological division of the burials between the first and the following generation in Povegliano Veronese and the differentiation between, between Roman and Longobard burials at La Selvicciola, we have performed a first set of um, infos about the stature. And with this analysis, the individuals of the first generation of Povegliano Veronese appeared to be taller than the ones from Selvicciola. And then, the slight decrease in stature at Povegliano in the subsequent generation is statistically significant. Anyway, all the individuals from Povegliano and La Selvicciola are taller than Roman inhabitants in Italy in the post-classical period. So, how can we proceed now? At the moment, we have tried to answer <coughs> in part to the questions about mobility, lifestyle, and diet. But it's necessary to extend the example to other individuals from the same necropolis, especially to understand the relationship <coughs> relationships between Lombards and locals. Moreover, other necropolises can be taken in consideration, uh, like, for example, San Mauro near Cividale del Friuli, to, to focus on the first Lombards arrived in the peninsula, or like Castel Trosino near the center of Italy, a very rich necropolis, very strategic, and in clear connection with the business <coughs> with Rome. It's clear, so, that the DNA analysis among the Germanic population and the Roman ones can help to understand the speed of integration and how the ethnicity was not so crucial in the migration period in Italy, as the successful example from Collegna has demonstrated with the interaction among Romans, Lombards and Franks. That is, at least here there are all the collaborators of the project and I want to thank you for listening. <laughs> Next up, we've got Katrin Mula um, from the University of Freiburg, who's looking at challenges and theories surrounding settlement in internal burial sites in southern Germany. And this work is from her master's thesis, but she's just started or just about to start her PhD. Oh, this one. Okay, I want to welcome you. Um, I will talk about the settlement internal burial sites. Uh, in southern Germany, as you heard, and um, with that, the transition of burial behavior in early medieval times. The settlement internal burial sites, uh, better known as farmyard burial grounds, um, were the theme of my master thesis, also as you heard, and today I want to present some challenges and theories uh, surround them. First, I want to give a short introduction into different burial forms. Uh, as from the Merovingian period, um, in southern Germany, different style of burial grounds can be observed from the late 7th century on. During that time, um, the usually used row graves yards or Reigendeberfelder start to decrease, while other forms came up, like the separation on row graveyards or total, totally separated small groups which seem to be created without references to any other structures. We can also um, observe circular trenches or burial mounds, and at least we can see a shift from outside of the settlement to the inside. Uh, next to the upcoming churchyards, also burials without any relation to churches come up, and these are the settlement internal burial sites. And by the end of this transitional period, the churchyard has established as the only burial ground. 
So, burials at churches are not part of this type, even if they are also located inside the settlement, uh, but another background is presumed. So now, how can burials be determined as settlement internal ones, and which conditions have to be given to be able to work with them? First, there are prerequisites. The graves have to be located inside the settlement, and, then, and it, the settlement has to be documented. And both of them, the settlement and the graves, need to have existed during the same time, which is not always easy to prove. And secondary requests, um, requisites help to identify whether the graves date approximately the same time as the settlement or not. An indication, therefore, can be if the graves show any relation to the settlement structure, structures or if they are orientated west-east. And third, the third point um, is that the research conditions ha that have to be given to be able to analyze this phenomena, that means, yeah, that means that on the one hand that the excavation techniques have to be modern uh, or at least the settlement, settlement itself has to be documented. Um, on the other hand, the data and research have to be accessible. So some of the most famous sites with graves inside settlements are not yet full pu published. So a real source criticism, criticism can hardly be done. Um, I followed my criteria and was able to identify 30 sites in southern Germany so far. Here you can see the examination area. It includes the regions Baden-Württemberg and Bavaria. The red dots mark the places where the burials were found. Uh, 23 of them are located in Bavaria, only seven in Baden-Württemberg. This doesn't display, display a, a real distribution, but also the intensity of um, archaeological research. Um, and that our dot here. Um, mark the location of Lauchheim, my next example. Um, this is, uh, it is one of the most popular grave groups in Germany. This group can be called a prime example. Mm -hmm. Seven graves are situated close to a farmyard, as the different stages of enclosure show. The second and third stage uh, date the same time as the graves. So over the time, graves were included to the farmyard. That makes it obvious that they belong together. As I said, this is a prime example. In Lauchheim, there are many graves and grave groups that are less known. <coughs> yes. Yeah. The group I just showed is down there in the east, southeast. Um, here you can see the whole plan of the excavation. The size of the ex excavation is for, of great <laughs> importance, but most of the time, they're, uh, they're then just one more than just one grave group can be observed, like you can see it. There are a lot more groups which are less known. Um, one reason is the amount of grave goods, as we heard before. There were found rich goods in the southeastern part group, and the others were less rich. Yeah. So the in investigation on these other graves were not that intense, like on the southern group. So they were never really considered so far. As I said, this example, the first example was a prime example. Usually the grave groups are less systematic. Um, so with a closer look, several forms can be observed. That's one example. This grave group five has a triangular form and is not included through trenches. The analysis of uh, Valerie Schoenberg, the excavator, point out that this group could be orientated on a pathway that can be observed very often. Also, it is unsure which structure the farm or farm they are following, so that's usually usually the case. It is not possible to say whom or which farm these to whom these graves belong to. The term of farm yard burial grounds implies implicates the belonging of the, of the grave, graves to a farm. Different forms and belongings brought me to the point to choose the term of settlement internal burial site. So now I'm going to present the previous chronological reconstruction of the transition from the row graves yard 
to the churchyard during the Merovingian period, the second half of the fifth till the beginning of the seventh century. People of the settlement or from several farms that used one big row graveyard. At the beginning of the late Mer Merovingian period, the second half of the seventh century, several other burial forms came up. Like I said at the beginning, <coughs> besides the row graveyards, it was possible to bury at other places like inside the settlement or especially at the churchyard. At the beginning of the 8th century, this phase is ending with the degrees of uh, the different types until the Carolingian period from the mid 8th century on, which is placed the last phase of the transition. The churchyard was established as the only burial ground while the other forms abandoned. This leads me to the main problem we have to solve with when studying the burial practice of the Carolingian period. In Germany, we have grave goods started, in Germany, grave goods start to disappear from the 7th, 8th century on. So there is a grave group, if there is a grave group with grave goods and without grave goods, the whole group will be dated by the goods. Yeah. Um, here, there, you can see how many graves were buried with goods of mine. I think the 30 sites include 883 graves, 305 of them are hard to determine, that's 35%, 247 burials or 28% <coughs> do have goods while 331 <coughs> burials and 37% do not have any goods or signs of them left. So the dating of the whole phenomena of graves inside settlement was archaeologically made by a few, like this 28%. <coughs> that makes it obvious that the end of the burials inside settlements is similar with the end of the practice to bury with grave goods. <laughs> um, by archaeological way, typology and stratigraphy, at least one side point to a longer dating phase of the phenomena. Bad Kotzing Glöckle Hof, one of the graves was sunk into the side of side wall of a cellar. And the terminus postquam of the 9th century is given by pottery found in the filling. But here, only at two of the 30 sites were graves dated by radio cavern analyzers. Both indicate a longer period of the settlement internal grave groups till the 9th or even 10th century. One of them is Kielham Kanal 1, as you see here. Um, here you can see the whole excavation area. The red circles mark the graves. The data displayed shows the Sigma II range. Uh, for one of these graves, it's possible to be created in the late 7th century, while for the others, it is likely to be created at the time between the second half and of the 8th and the 10th, 10th century. <coughs> this date must be the beginning of new investigations to determine, I, d determine the runtime for uh, more precisely. Now I want to change the point of view to now I presented some challenges when studying the end of the transition. Now I want to discuss the beginning of the or origin of the phenomena, which reasons led to people, led the people to bury their relatives within the space of the living. There are three various three theories why the people started to bury their relatives inside of the settlement. I want to present and discuss them in a, a simplified form. These theories are based on religion, on vertical soci social diversity, and on horizontal social diversity. So the theory about a radical change in the religious beliefs, which affects the birds in an elementary way, while the church and Christianity are evolving more and more, is the first part. Um, the people did not want to bury on a pagan row graveyard anymore, so other burial sites needed to be created. The best way would have been at a churchyard. Churches were um, not located in every settlement yet, so they had to bury somewhere else. And on the other hand, the theory, theory was turned around so that only the burial at the church is Christian, while the other forms, like the farmyard burials, are pagan. Today we know about so many counter-arguments for both of them. That this, this theory cannot be the answer. Um, first, the row graveyards are already established in a Christian context. 
and some of the burials on rural graveyards and inside of settlements have Christian grave, grave goods like gold foil crosses which demonstrate <coughs> the Christian surrounding. Another point is that we do not know any prohibition of other burial grounds than the churchyard. The only prohibition we know is by Charlemagne at the end of the 8th century. These are directed at the Saxons and within their context they are limited in space and time. They do not allow any general generalization. Um, special grave constructions or that's yeah or rich grave goods are used as a marker for an upper social class. There can be started a long discussion about grave goods and what they can tell us about the status of the buried person, but here I don't want to focus on that. But what can be said is that, as you saw, only 28% were buried with goods. Only 16 burials of these do have an extraordinary rich furnishing. That's around 1.8% of all burials found inside of settlements. Andrea Chermak did some uh, morphologic studies and nitrogen as a topic analyzes to define the quality of the specific diet uh, of the birds of the site of Kelheim, uh, the example you saw before. Uh, the re results of a comparison within the graves and the graves of a close row graveyard show no differences. So an upper social class cannot be proven here. It seems like there was no restriction of who is allowed to be buried there, at least in terms of vertical social diversity. Another theory why this burial form came up is the consoli consolidation of land. Did the owner try to legitimize a claim on farmstead and land? We can hardly re reconstruct the ownership of this time, so this thesis can hardly be pr verified. Um, as Franz Theo said, uh, showed the creation of an ancestral order could be a way of formulating such a claim. This order can be created by founding uh, by the founding of a grave group with a rich equipment or rich, rich equipped grave of a male on a farmyard. Looking at the single graves and assuming that it was not intended that they should remain single at the time of their formation, but should form the beginning of a group, we see that the, th this model does not apply to southern Germany. Less then 40% of all single burials are male, and only about 30% do have grave goods, but not especially rich ones. So first, summarizing, the current theories are not convincing enough to explain the phenomena. However, it seems like the people have the free choice where to bury their relatives. What can be said is that there are too many of these small burial grounds to be considered as unusual questions come up. Did the family become more important during this time? At least death was more integrated into the social, uh, into the society of the living. Uh, did this lead, the, lead to the change in the form of burial? And second, the transition of burial grounds was already declared to be explained, but as the possibilities of archaeological, archaeological research move on, the death data shows a long-lasting development or continuity rather than a break and radical change. More, more of the graves should be dated by radio cavern analysis or dendrochronology if possible. This will help to fulfill the gap of the 9th and 10th century. The problem of missing dates is not only a challenge when studying the settlement internal burials but also of the other types of burial grounds. The still used but outdated model of transition from the row graveyard to the churchyard needs to be redesigned. Thank you.